Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. We're going to get cracking here. We've got a number of forests and tree pests that Ellen and I will talk about here in the next couple hours. So let's get going, shall we? Let's see this. Yes. All right. So boom. first, a quick disclaimer for any of you that have seen my talks before, you know, I give mostly uh, peer-reviewed, legitimate information, but on occasion you are going to get my opinion. I've been doing this for a while and I've seen some things, so I feel it pertinent at times to let you know kind of how I think things do or don't work in some of these cases. So let's jump right into the Asian longhorn beetle. For those of you from South Carolina, you know this has been big news in the last year or so. We recently became the most, uh, the latest state to get infestation of this thing that is native to Asia with a very, very wide host range. Uh, we do have eradication efforts underway. This is one of the few big forest invasives that we actually can eradicate, so we are cautiously optimistic. It is a large white beetle with uh, black, or a large black beetle with white stripes, rather, black and white striped antennae, and then when those feet dry out, they actually have a bluish tint to them. So if you get one dry, this one I'm holding is fresh out of ethanol, so you don't really see the blue, but it is a, a pretty striking beetle once you see it. The females uh, come out in the spring, they emerge in the spring, they start chewing these egg niches on trees. That's just kind of a little conical divot on the tree. And then just, just to reiterate right now, as far as the Southeast is concerned, this thing is only found in South Carolina. There's actually, there's also infestations in Ohio, but right now you're looking at Ohio, South Carolina. Mostly we want y'all to be aware of what it looks like and what the damage looks like. because We're always trying to keep our eyes open for this thing. So these egg niches can be kind of all over the tree. We see them in, in some of that smooth bark, sometimes in some of that rougher bark too. In this case, that female or the female has just made a line of them going up and down the tree. She'll turn around and lay one egg inside there. And then after a little while, a couple, three weeks after those eggs hatch and those larvae start to feed on that phloem tissue, you'll see bleeding at these egg sites. So this was kind of uh, July, about uh, right around July down here in South Carolina. You saw this bleeding all over the place. And then shortly thereafter, when the larvae turned and started feeding on the wood, we had sawdust and sort of frass shavings all over the place. If you look on the right in this picture, you can see it actually got pushed out of there almost like a tube, like a, a piece of spaghetti getting pushed out. It tended to fall all over cobwebs and leaves and everything below it. There's just lots and lots of sawdust everywhere. And I'll also note, note that all of these presentations today, we're gonna to get you copies of the slides. So we'll make a folder available at the end of this and then you can have these images and all this information that we're presenting today. So you've got this sawdust from the larvae that are feeding and this is the real damaged part is these larger larvae create this damage inside the tree and they pretty much Swiss cheese the, the, uh, the stem, the branches, they cause lots of feeding damage and they really cause a deterioration of the structural integrity of that tree and that branch. So the larvae are a good size. You see one next to a dime. And then you can see they just make big holes all the way through there. So what that does is that really makes that tree or that branch susceptible to breakage, especially in wind. Now here's sort of our, uh, this is a good example I have of the, the whole anatomy of the larval damage Right about here is where that oviposition site was, that egg niche. That's where that happened. The larva started feeding uh, in that area of the phloem. And then you see, you can barely see it here, but this is where that larva turned in. So they feed on the phloem for a few instars and then they go straight inside the tree. Then this is kind of the area where they're feeding on the wood, going back and forth, creating that Swiss cheese effect. Uh, and then you can see this is where the adults exit the tree. They always exit in a circular hole. This hole is large enough to stick a pencil in, so that's a good diagnostic. If you can take a pencil and stick it in there an inch to an inch and a half, and you're on one of their whole species, this is a good chance you might have something to be concerned about here. Again, we mentioned a lot of the damage is from the late larval feeding because you get all these branches falling down, large chunks, small chunks, all sorts of stuff comes off. Uh, this particular branch, here's the end of it. You can see it in my hand on the left. It's a fairly good sized branch. And if you look here, this is all the different larval damage from this thing. So you can see that there's so much larval feeding right there, just completely snapped off. And then looking up, you know, I took this picture and then I basically looked up and you've got stuff 
hanging in the trees, the widow makers, as we call them, that are just sort of hanging there waiting. And then a lot of other branches that have been broken and fallen and caught. Uh, you can often see an exit hole just a few inches above where they fed because that's where a lot of that larval feeding is. Here's one of those egg niches next to an exit hole. They're roughly the same size, about the size of a, the egg niches are about the size of a nickel. Exit holes are about the size of a dime, maybe not quite that large. The adults do feed. Uh, they feed a little bit on some of those tender shoots. You can see on that green shoots that the adults have fed and eaten some of that, uh, that green tissue. This damage is negligible to the tree. It does little to no damage whatsoever. The real damage is from that larval, uh, larval feeding on the wood where it really breaks down the structural integrity, causes breakage. Can you prevent these things somewhat? You can prevent them by not letting them get there. There is some evidence that some, uh, you know, herb or some insecticides can work, although it's not great uh, efficacy. Can you save a tree once it has Asian longhorn beetle? At this point, no. Once a tree has Asian longhorn beetle, uh, that tree is destined to be cut down and chipped up or destroyed in some way. If you're in one of the areas with Asian longhorn beetle, we need to work with your state regulatory folks and your USDA APHIS. This is a federally regulated uh, invasive species, so there's a lot of uh, different things that go along with it. So if you see something, say something. We'll just leave it at that. All right, let's go to another one, the spotted lanternfly. This is a major press pest of fruit trees and vines, also native to China, Bangladesh, Vietnam. First found in Pennsylvania a few years ago in 2014, seven years ago now. Here is what the larvae and adults look like. They're striking little things. Uh, the, the larvae, uh, or I should say the nymphs on the left, they start out as black and white. And as they get a little bit older, they develop a reddish color to them. And then there's an the adult on the tip of my finger. You can see it's a solid half inch or so long. It's got those black spots on it. And this is our current distribution for the spotted lanternfly. Again, it was first found in southeastern Pennsylvania. And you can see that's kind of the epicenter of the distribution. It's now in the Virginias, Ohio, New York, several northeastern states. The life cycle for the spotted lanternfly is somewhat standard for one of these plant hopper type insects. Uh, on the far left there, you can see the egg mass. And this basically, to me, it, to me, it looks like a piece of brown silly putty that you pressed onto something. And they will lay their eggs on a lot of different things, on the bark of trees, on inanimate objects, on rocks, all sorts of stuff they will put their eggs on there. The nymphs then will hatch. You can see on the bottom, you've got the black and white nymphs that hatch out. They start feeding on any number of different uh, host species. I think the host list is well over 70 different species now. As the larvae get older, they develop that reddish color. You see that on the right-hand side. And then they turn into the adults, and that's where they develop their wings. They are not great flyers, even though they have wings. They are quite good at climbing up to the top of things, and then uh, they will jump. They're great jumpers, and they can jump and fly. And if they catch the wind, they can travel quite a ways in that manner. But just to, to take off and fly, they're not that great at it. They do have a strong preference for the tree of heaven. So you can see a number of spotted lantern flies at the base of the tree of heaven uh, here on the, on the, on the left-hand side. This, uh, well, two things. They'll never get, you know, we'll never be rid of all the tree of heaven. It's not like they're going to kill them all. That's simply not going to happen. But you can use these tree of heaven as trap trees, as sentinel trees. If these things get to a new area, by and large, the tree of heaven is the first thing they're going to go to. So if you're in an area that has tree of heaven, that is where you can focus your scouting efforts to try to get rid of those. You can inject trees or inject plants with systemic insecticides, and that works pretty well. So it's not that these things can't be killed. It's just that it takes a fairly sustained effort. Uh, and monitoring is especially important. These things tend to get into all sorts of different uh, vehicles, and they, get, they travel around quite a bit. They've been found in a number of different states. And uh, this is one of those that we really want to keep our eye open for because they do tend to travel and hitchhike on a lot of different things. And as Sarah mentioned, if there's questions, feel free to put those in the chat box. We will get those at the end of each of these sessions, and then we're going to have some time at the very end of the program today. We can also handle some questions then. 
All right, let's get into some pine pests now. So we've got native pine bark beetles. We will do these first. Down here in the southeast, we have seven native pine bark beetle species. You've got the Ips on the left. You've got Calligraphus pinei granicollis and avulsus. We've got the turpentine beetles, which are Dendrochthonus terebrans and, and D. valens. And then we've got the southern pine beetle, Dendrochthonus frontalis. This is where we will start today. SPB is the number one pine killing insect in the southeastern US. Uh, you see this nice typical uh, infestation zone here where you've got a little circle in the very middle that's green and then as it goes out from there you've got brown and then red and then yellow and then green. Southern pine beetle infestations start at a single point generally and then they move out either, either out in a perfect circle or they will go with the wind. In this case it was the circle. So the brown trees in the middle, those have been dead the longest and all the needles have fallen off. The red trees are kind of next to that. And then you see yellow trees on the edge next to green trees. When you look at the Southern Pine Beetle risk map, it's a fairly simple risk map in that if, if there's a pine tree there, if pines grow there, it is at risk for Southern Pine Beetle. So these populations oscillate, they're up, they're down. Uh, it, tends to be that they're, they're very difficult to catch if you're not actually in an outbreak, uh, an outbreak phase. We've had a lot of trouble trying to figure out where are they when it's not an outbreak. Uh, sometimes they say outbreaks coincide with droughts, but I think a lot of what the outbreak is is, is management-based. So how do we know if we have a southern pine beetle infestation? One of the first things I look for is green pine needles falling on the ground. That is a very typical southern pine beetle thing you will see is those green needles just drop to the ground. Beyond that, you start to look at the actual tree themselves. So when the adult attacks a tree, the tree is going to try to protect itself. It's going to pitch, pitch out that beetle. So the beetle tries to chew a hole, the pine tree puts out pitch to try to entomb or trap that beetle. If they're able to get through like they are, you see here on the left, there's a hole there. So the beetle actually got into the tree then you'll still see a little pitch tube and you can see that on the right, you have all these little white uh, pitch tubes. Southern pine beetle pitch tubes generally are in the cracks of the bark. So they're between those big bark plates. So you'll see them kind of in rows going up and down the tree. If you look inside there, these pine beetles tend to make S shaped or kind of wavy galleries. And if you look on this one, you can see right about here is where that beetle went in. And then if you follow that S shaped gallery, first to the right and then it curves around. You can see over here is your actual beetle still making uh, the gallery, the female beetle. And then in heavy infestations, you can peel the bark back and it just looks like a, a whole mess of wavy S-shaped galleries. Looking closely, the larvae feed and then they, they poop on the other end. So you've got this frass pack gallery where they're feeding on one end and pooping on the other. The beetles bring with them blue stained fungi. You can see this here. This is not degrading the structural quality of the wood, but it is making it a little trickier if this is going to the pulp mill because this is one extra step that they will have to take to get that color out of there. Then after the beetles have done their thing inside the tree, they exit and there is no pitch tube, right? So as the beetle tries to get in, the tree is putting out the pitch to protect itself. After the beetles have sort of won the battle, think of it that way, they leave with zero resistance. That's why you see these, you know, hundreds and thousands of exit holes on a tree and there's no pitch there because the beetles are just leaving at that point. How do we manage southern pine beetle? Well, there's a very extensive trapping effort that goes on across the southeast every year. Uh, each state uh, runs their traps. We look at the number of southern pine beetles to predator beetles and that helps us try to predict where there's going to be issues that year. Once a, a beetle infestation is found, you can actually cut around that beetle infestation and that will help stop it. So we tend to tell folks, you need to find the edge of your infested area, look at the height of that tree. Let's say that tree is 50 feet on the very edge, right? The tree is just starting to turn yellow. It's the last one out there is 50 feet tall. You're going to want to cut a buffer of green healthy trees one and a half times the height of that tallest one. So if your tree is 50 feet tall, you're going to want a buffer of at least 75 feet of green trees. Uh, and what that will do is that will stop that infestation. 
Uh, we'll talk a little more about why that is, but the, the key with southern pine beetles is cutting around uh, the infested area. If you're lucky, you can salvage some of those logs. Sometimes this, uh, it depends on where you are, what the mills are taking. Uh, I've heard stories where if, if you can uh, give them maybe some extra green trees, they will also take some of the dead or dying ones to salvage. Debarking is one thing that happens a lot of times in Central America. Uh, southern pine beetles also native there. Uh, again, we mentioned predators, clarid beetles. You can actually see a southern pine beetle in the jaws of this clarid beetle. These are very important predators for southern pine beetle. They have a big influence on populations. And finally, management. We know that thinning your forests and keeping your basal area below 120 uh, feet per acre is key for southern pine beetle management. To that end, we do have the Southern Pine Beetle Prevention Program. This is a federal government run program. Started in 03. It started after the last really, really big Southern Pine Beetle outbreak from 99 to 02. And what this does in, in very basic terms, it provides money to the states to use as cost share to help uh, encourage landowners to do silvicultural treatments to reduce the chance of Southern Pine Beetle infestation. And one of the things, you know, we talked about thinning. Uh, planting the right tree on the right site, prescribed fire, all sorts of different things can be uh, appropriate treatments and what treatments are available to you depends on your state. So get with your state forestry commission, uh, forest health team, and they can help you figure out how you can use this program if you're growing pine. Now we mentioned earlier that thinning is a key to southern pine beetle management. We know that if we keep the stands thin under a certain basal area, we have a better chance of uh, resisting southern pine beetle. I just want to give you an example. So we went to Mississippi and a few years ago, they had a big outbreak there. And we looked in two national forests, the Bienville and Homochitto. We looked at 910 total spots across the whole national forest. And we found almost every single one of them in unthinned stands. We just didn't find spots in thinned stands. I think there was two or three total spots we found in those thin Stand. So it was very obvious that the thicker the, the thicker the stand, the higher the basal area, the more chance there was of having a southern pine beetle. In some cases, we had thin stands right next to outbreak areas, and they just didn't get into that outbreak area. If you want to look at it graphically, these are two of the easiest pie charts I've ever made. If it's blue, it's unthinned. If it's red, it is thin. So you see that tiny sliver of red down there. Uh, if you are still not convinced, here's one of our aerial photos. So this Area was thinned right here. This was thinned in 2011. Southern pine beetle went over the whole thing. And then in 2012, the spot perfectly matched up with the border of that thinned area. So they hit the unthinned stuff, stopped at the thin stuff. So thinning is by far the easiest, uh, most sensible way to avoid southern pine beetle damage. Now let's talk about Ips bark beetles. There's four species in the southeast. Of these four, Ips pinei is pretty much only found in the mountainous areas in the Appalachians, uh, Calligraphus, Granicolis, and Avulsus. You can find them anywhere else throughout the southeastern pine growing region. These beetles have a little spikes on the end of their bodies, and they make, a, uh, they make characteristic galleries in the bark. They are often shaped like a, a letter, like H or a Y or an X. Uh, very common throughout the southeast. They are attracted to weakened or stressed trees. The male starts the gallery and then calls in the female using pheromones. Damage from Ips is especially common during drought times. This is the main bug factor we have. If there's a big drought, you see Ips spots all the time. It's very much, uh, you know, one leads to the other for the most part. Under normal conditions, Ips are out there and they are just picking off old or weak branches or trees. So in this picture, you can see Right here, there's probably ips because this particular branch was wounded or being shed by the tree. And over here, you see this slash pine that had a branch fall from the storm. The rest of these pines were perfectly healthy, but this one fallen broken branch was completely riddled with ips. So they're all over the place. Uh, they're always out there. They're just kind of going for the weak stuff. From a tree perspective, you'll see that branch flagging like we just saw. You'll see a fading crown and then that yellow red needle coloration. So this, it differs a little bit in that if it's a southern pine beetle infestation, the crown tends to fade mostly at the same time. For Ips, you see kind of a patchy crown fade. I think this picture on the right is a really good 
characteristic ips because you have some parts of the crown that are still green, some are yellow and some are red all at the same time. Then as you get closer, you get the pitch tubes. The, the, uh, the pitch tubes tend to be uh, on the, the bark plates, but you also get those galleries and that dust. There's many overlapping generations for your for ips. Like I had said earlier, they're always out there all the time. Ips of also so small ones, can complete a full generation in two weeks. So two weeks from egg to adult, uh, 10 or more generations per year. They do have a high threshold for heat. Again, in those hot and droughty times is when you tend to see a lot of ips. Now these can attack on stress and injured trees. The tree stress can be caused by any number of things, whether it's abiotic or biotic, storms, lightning, fire damage, if your fire gets too hot, mechanical damage, if you've got a harvester going through there and they're scraping a bunch of trees. All of these different types of damage can stress a tree and all of that can lead to ips attack. And then how does this work? How do ips attack? You know, if they're always out there, why are they only attacking certain trees? Well, so the minute a tree starts to get stressed, it puts out certain chemicals uh, for pines and monoterpenes and ethanol. And ips are always kind of flying around out there and they sense that. So once they sense that, the ips go to that tree and then they start putting out their own chemicals, their aggregation pheromones. These chemicals just call in other ips. It's like saying, hey, the buffet's open, come and eat. So these other ips start coming in, but those other chemicals also attract other insects, the predator beetles and the predators, and then also the competitors. We'll talk about a couple of those later. So once a tree goes down that path of being weak and puts out those chemicals and ips come and they put out their chemicals, it just starts a whole thing uh, to where lots of different things come to this tree that eventually leads to the actual demise of the tree. Now we mentioned this spot formation for southern pine beetles starts as a big spot and then grows uh, kind of continuously. Ips damage from the air looks like a dead tree here and a dead tree there. And if you look on this picture, you can sort of see there's trees here and trees there that have become spotty uh, and, and you don't have a big centralized location. Sporadic mortality, you can get clusters. In some cases, if you've got a tree that's really high uh, has a high level of ips uh, inside it, they can spill over to the next tree. That doesn't always happen. So there's a lot of natural predators and parasite, parasitoids that will help keep those ips in check. Unlike southern pine beetle, there is no ips monitoring program. It is, uh, you know, it is kind of reported as it's seen. So no one really specifically goes and looks for ips. That changes a little bit if it's a big drought, but the monitoring is mostly visual assessments either on the ground or from the air. Now, turpentine beetles, Dendrochnus terebrans being the black turpentine beetle and D. valens being the red turpentine beetle. D. valens is found mostly where you, found, where you find Ips pinei up in the mountainous type areas, North Georgia, uh, extreme upstate South Carolina, extreme Northern Alabama, and then up into the mountains. The black turpentine beetle is found everywhere. So that is your main uh, pine issue you have here in the Southeast. The black and the red turpentine beetle basically do the same stuff. So I'm gonna give you just the black turpentine beetle information here. You have these really big pitch tubes. Uh, these things can be the circumference of a half dollar. They can stick out an inch or so from the tree. They're much, much larger than either Ips or Southern Pine Beetle. You tend to find them on the bottom 10 feet or so of the tree. And they often have a lot of resin that drips down from them. If you happen to go and see one of the uh, peel the bark back and look for one of the galleries. It's not too much to look at. It kind of looks like a number seven or a, a, a question mark or a backwards J. Uh, and a lot of times if you pull that bark off, the larvae just sort of fall down to the ground. Uh, it's very unlike Southern Pine Beetle or Ips, where if you pull the bark back, the larvae will still be in the galleries on the bark. Turpentine beetles, they all just sort of fall to the ground. These are not very uh, aggressive beetles. They go to weak trees, they go to stressed trees, they go to damaged trees, okay? And then much like Ips, if there's droughts, they can have high mortality. Black turpentine beetle pitch tubes are often found by cankers, whether that's fusiform or, or some other wound from either really hot fire or from mechanical damage. And then one thing I tend to see quite a bit is these pitch BBs. If you look on the right, you see what looks like little BB-sized pitch balls kind of at the base there. 
that's from the beetles. The adult beetles are big enough to where they try to chew into the tree. The tree puts out the sap and they keep swimming and swimming and swimming and they form these little balls that roll down. That's a good characteristic. Uh, those balls are much bigger than any of the, the sawdust or the, the, the you know, frass that might come from an Ips bark beetle. Now we've talked a bit about how Ips and turpentine beetles, uh, they really go for the weakened trees. And I give, I'm give you a little example here. This is a tree, this is a very healthy 13 year old Loblolly pine in Aiken County, South Carolina, down by the Savannah River. Uh, I tied a bunch of baits to it. So I made it look like this tree was attacked. I made it seem like this tree was attacked because of all the chemicals coming off, right? There were chemicals that the trees put off. And then I also had chemical pouches on there that were Ips uh, lures. And so I just watched the progression of beetles that came to this tree and you see three, three different things. So the first beetles that came to this tree, now remember this tree was completely healthy. They were met with a huge amount of resistance. So massive pitch tubes. Uh, if you pick that open, I actually picked that one open and there was a beetle down inside there completely entombed. So the healthy tree was able to completely fight off this beetle. But because there was all this other, these other chemicals that made other beetles go to it, uh, the beetles kept coming, right? And so as they keep coming, you see the pitch tubes get smaller because the, the tree just keeps taking on these attacks. So yes, it still puts up a bit of a fight, but if you look kind of on the top of that pitch tube, you'll see there's a little hole there. So that adult beetle eventually got inside. And as beetles keep attacking and keep attacking, pretty soon you see there's very little resistance whatsoever. This beetle uh, encountered very little resistance, basically just chewed its way in and there it was. So this gets back to the whole healthy trees can re resist a lot of these problems. They can resist a lot of the ips, a lot of the turpentine beetles. Your southern pine beetle is the main pine bark beetle in the south that can hit a healthy tree. That's it. Problem being, if it's overstocked, you're at much higher susceptibility. Now, in addition to Ips and black turpentine beetles, uh, monocamus beetles come to trees that are often stressed or almost dying, right? These are the great big wood borers. They make the crunch, crunch, crunch. You can sometimes hear a characteristic here is this egg niche, and it almost looks like a little inverted cone that gets chewed into the bark. You can see one at the tip of my finger here. And if you look on this picture, here is one of those standard Ips pitch tubes right on the flat plate of the bark. And next to it is one of those monocamus egg niches. And as they turn around and lay an egg niche here, they are, those eggs are going to hatch into these large Sawyer beetle larvae. And again, these are the ones that feed on, they feed underneath the bark, kind of on whatever is left of the phloem. And they make that crunch, crunch, crunching you can sometimes hear if you're standing next to one of these pine trees. These are not things that are going to kill your tree. These are things that are going to come to that tree that's almost dead and almost on its way out anyway. One other thing we sometimes see are these eastern pine weevils, the deodar weevil. These make these uh, little circular chip cocoons, we call them, and inside there the larva feeds and the uh, pupa uh, happen. So you'll see sometimes these when the bark falls off, you can see these things kind of stuck all over the tree. Again, these are not things that are killing the tree. They're coming to a tree that's weak. The other thing is going to be ambrosia beetles. Uh, this is the most common pine ambrosia beetle, this platypus species. This uh, produces what I call powder. So if you have a lot of ambrosia beetles on a pine tree, it's almost like there's a really, really fine dust or powder that accumulates at the base of that tree. All right, we'll talk about a few diseases here. Fusiform rust is one of our first ones. This is the worst forest disease in the southeastern U.S. It creates stem and branch cankers, and it's an issue in both the nurseries and plantations. It's got a very complicated life cycle, different stages, different hosts. All that you really need to know, though, is that this fungus alternates between oak and pine. So it is on oak one year. It looks like, a, it just kind of looks like little black hairs on the underside of the leaf, and it's on pine the next year, and that's where it causes those big Anchors. Uh, Loblolly and slash are the most susceptible. Longleaf is somewhat susceptible. Uh, and then the black oaks are quite susceptible as far as the oaks go. Rust, fusiform rust makes these big cankers. And right about this time in spring is when you see them completely covered in that orange Cheeto dust powder, I like to call it. This is when they're sporulating. You get uh, mortality if this thing uh, hits on a branch or a stem. It tends to die and sends up a whole bunch of other. Uh, 
other stems next to that cankered area. On long leaf, sometimes you see it on the seedlings. You can see on the left, you've got that bulbous growth right on the long leaf seedling. And then it also will hit the long leaf uh, stems as well, as well as slash and, and blah, 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 you know, all that. Often you'll get breakage at the cankers. This is one of the big issues with fusiform rust is these things break. Cankers are also very attractive to ips and turpentine beetles. So you'll often see one with the other. You'll see a lot of ips, uh, especially turpentine beetle pitch tubes next to fusiform cankers. Fusiform rust does impact growth. So I'll give you a little example here. This fellow in the blue shirt is Patrick Cumby with Arborgen. He's about six feet tall, about my height. And he's, in, he's standing in two three-year-old loblolly pine trials. This is a trial. You can see how tall he is compared to these trees. These trees on the left are un... Uh, they're just kind of your base loblolly. They're not resistant to anything. And then across the road, he's in a resistance stand. So they've bred resistance for fusiform rust here. And you can see the huge growth difference. Again, these trees are the same age. They're basically on the same site. It's just separated by a road. And uh, you can see the big growth difference because, uh, because of the fusiform rust. How do we manage fusiform? Well, in nurseries, there's plenty of chemical treatments we can do. Uh, this happens um, quite regularly. It's quite effective. The fusiform rust uh, spores can get on that rapidly growing area. So some will say if you wait to fertilize until the trees get a little older, you will reduce the susceptibility. Breeding resistance, uh, this is one of the main things. Breeding for fusiform rust resistance is one of our main uh, success stories in forest health as far as that goes. And then honestly, there's a little bit of luck that has to do with it. Uh, you've seen a lot of areas where you might have a high fusiform area and then a whole uh, no fusiform right next to it. It just really, really depends. Um, so there's a little luck that has to go with that. All right, now we are on a nosum root rot. Depending on how old you are, you might also call this heterobasidian root rot, anosum, anosis, or foamies root rot. They're all the same thing brought on by heterobasidian irregular. One of the worst forest diseases in the southeast for pine, it's probably disease number two behind fusiform. This one invades and degrades the root system, and these spores are spread by wind. So we say they're spread by wind. That's one way they can move. You can see here. Uh, a spore in the blue can get blown onto a freshly cut stump. That can also grow down into that stump, and then you can get it where it will grow into a neighboring tree that's alive. So these things spread either by wind or they spread by growing from one infected stump or infected root into a live tree. I know some root rot is kind of difficult to find or difficult to diagnose, I should say, because it really just looks like the pines are giving up. You see, it, it looks similar to Ibs damage where you'll kind of get a spot that just doesn't look all that great. Uh, you get more loss of foliage than browning, so you don't really get that real yellow or red to yellow type of situation. You can look for pockets, especially on former ag lands, and trees can be prone to falling over. This is very different than with Ips. So for a nosum root rod, if you've seen one of these areas, it looks like you've got uh, some damage, some trees falling over, that type of thing. You need to do some digging. You need to look here. Uh, if you get into those roots, you can sometimes see that they are extremely resinosis. There's lots of resin in there. There's lots of different uh, resin. The odor in sandier soils, you'll actually see it sticking to the root itself. As the disease progresses, you have a lot of white rot and the roots completely degrade. And then that, again, can lead to that falling over. And I need everyone to give me just one moment, please. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. The joys of working at home with children. Okay. So we're talking about a nosum root rod and that you can have that, uh, those falling over pockets is one of the, the keys there. So the risk for a nosum root rot really has to depend on the soil. Soils have a big impact on how much risk you're at for I know some root rot, high risk soils, sandy or sandy loam soils, deep ones, at least 12 inches deep. Again, former ag lands are some of the biggest, uh, biggest areas we find this on. Medium risk is gonna be those silt or silt loam soils, again, about 12 inches deep or so. 
And lower risk is the poorly drained clay and clay loam, especially with the high water table. When you look at a root rot hazard map for the southeastern US, you can see soil, again, soil type has a lot to do with it. You can see some of that fall line area right there with the high hazard. And even on a small scale, so just a standard plot map, you can have multiple different risk ratings in one stand of trees, right? This is just a small scale here. You can see it goes from high to moderate to low. For managing root rot, there's a few things we can do. If you've got a stand that's got a lot of root rot in it, you can just do a clear cut because this will halt the damage. The reason being you can cut those trees and if those spores land on the stumps, they can't grow into anything else, right? So they hit the stump and just kind of be done at that point. There are a couple different stump treatments that you can do for anosum. Uh, there's borax type treatments. There's also some uh, Flebiopsis uh, biocontrol uh, that you can spray on there. Flebiopsis is a fungus that basically grows faster than heterobacidium and it grows and creates a cap on top of there. So that can also be done. And one thing, one option for those in the, the deep, deep south is to thin during the summer months. And we do this because if you're below this 34 degree line, it tends to get so warm in the summer that the, uh, the, the top of those cut stumps heats up so quickly. If a nodosum spore lands on there, it's gonna fry before it gets a chance to grow down into the ground. So it'll, it'll take care of it that way. All right, now we'll talk about pitch canker. This is named for the large amount of resin that happens at that canker. Uh, we do see this occasionally in seed orchard and some of these other plantings. You can get those outbreaks, and, and I'm not going to say they're spread by the, this beetle, the Viadar weevil, but there is some association there, mostly because these weevils tend to walk in that pitch and get the wet, dirty feet and can spread spores uh, in that way. Primary symptoms for pitch canker are these dead needles and very, very heavy resin flow on the terminal leaders. And one thing that I have noticed is that when a tree has a canker or some sort of fungal issue, those needles tend to droop down. As zips bark beetles, which also kills terminals and, and branches here and there, the needles tend to stay out. They'll still turn brown, but with a the fungus, they tend to droop down. The chief hosts for this disease are slash shortleaf, Virginia and longleaf. You can see it on a lot of different things, but this is commonly where you see it. Here's a young longleaf with the terminal leader. Uh, completely covered in pitch canker. And if you really get in there, cut some of those tissues away, you can see that heavy, heavy pitch flow just dripping down. If you cut the tree down at the canker, you'll see a very standard triangular cross-section damage pattern. So this is what we see with pitch, uh, kind of makes that V shape all the way to the middle. Just an, an example here, we got these, uh, this issue a few years ago in a Florida seed orchard in North Florida. They had trees about 60 feet tall and they were having reports of damage about halfway up. And you can see a lot of that crown is brownish there in that picture. They had about a 20% infection rate, but the infection rate, you know, when you got to those infected trees, it was really, really high. Uh, these things looked almost like a candle. There was so much uh, pitch dripping down them and it coated pretty much everything below, you know, the ground, uh, the vegetation on the ground, everything was just coated in pitch from all the cankers. Severe infection can occur in some places and unfortunately there's no treatment for it. Pitch canker, the option is to get rid of the infested material. So if this happens in a stand that you're trying to grow for commercial purposes, you know, these might be some of the trees you try to take out in that first thinning. If it's a seed orchard, there's not much you can do unfortunately except get rid of what's left and kind of move on at that point. Now, brown spot needle blight is another one of those fungi on pine trees. This primarily damages longleaf, but we've also seen it in lob and slash. This is rarely going to kill a tree, but it will delay growth. And these spores are spread by the wind and the rain. And it's so named because on those needles, you can see on the right, there's a, a little yellow border and then around a brown spot, hence brown spot needle blight. And what this tends to do is it tends to make the older needles fall off that tree. Uh, again, you see it mostly in seedlings or sort of grass stage longleaf pines. Here you can see, if you look carefully, there's a little bit, a few inches of the actual stem where the needles have completely fallen off. And those needles just sit underneath 
that seedling. You can see it even happens on some of these older ones. Uh, the problem here is that all those infected needles that have fallen off that seedling are just sitting underneath there. And they are the ones that have the inoculum to reinfest the tree. So every time the wind blows or it rains and stuff splashes, that inoculum can then splash back up and hit those needles which get infected and then fall out themselves. How do we manage brown spot needle blight? Well, there are resistant seedlings you can use. But since this is a fungus and it really prefers that you know, moist uh, type area, you want to promote aeration in your young stands. And how can we do that? We can use foliar fungicide, sure. But if we're talking longleaf, we're really talking about fire. Longleaf should be getting burned on a regular basis anyway. This is an, it just an, a, the perfect way to get rid of uh, brown spot needle blight is you run a fire over there. It will burn up that inoculum. It will burn up those needles that have fallen and it will take care of things. So if you're managing the, if the long leaf stand is being managed as it should with fire on appropriate intervals, brown spot needle blight, blight might flare up here and there, but it's probably not gonna be a problem. And finally, needle cast disease is another one. This has been very common across the Southeast the last few years. Needle cast is a general term for, that's made by several species of fungi. Lophodermium is one of the big ones. And then depending on the species of fungi, they might affect the current or last year's needles. Lophodermium, for instance, likes those needles that are at least two years old. With needle cast disease, the needles brown, die, and then fall off. And you know, in some of these cases, you can look under a, a hand lens and you can see the little fruiting bodies uh, Lophodermium look like footballs, others look like more circular type things. So your needle cast disease, the death progresses from the tips of the needles inward on the current or last year needles. So when we're talking about some of these foliar diseases, the pattern of needle death is extremely important. For needle cast disease, it starts at the tips, works its way in, and then that is what the needle cast looks like. Eventually those needles are going to just brown and completely fall off. It gives the tree itself uh, kind of a dingy brownish look uh, overall over the whole thing. Some lookalikes include tip blight. Uh, the difference here being all these needles on the tip die at once. So it's not, they don't start from one end and work their way in, they die at once. And if you look really closely on this picture, you can see brown spot needle blight on one of those other needles sitting right there. We've got the yellow and a little bit of brown in the middle of it. So lookalike to needle cast is diploidia tip blight. Again, those needles die all at once, not from the outside in. You also have pine needle rust. This is coleosporium. These start out looking like little white wings on the needles. Uh, just looks like little white plasticky wings. Eventually that needle is going to yellow brown and fall off. This is fairly uncommon. You see it here and there in little, little patches and spots but it's not something that kind of gets over a widespread area-wide type of thing. And then one of the other main things we see with pine needles is just normal pine needle senescence. Uh, this occurs on needles that are not the current year's growth. You can see here the last year's needle growth on this loblolly pine is turning brown and falling off. A lot of folks forget that needles are just leaves and they do shed. We do get rid of the old needles and bring in the new needles. This is where pine straw comes from. So normal pine senescence does occur. Again, this is gonna be on the older needles. 